I am Khadija and I am here with Ethan Brown, the producer of Murder in the Bayou, a five part series that airs on Showtime. He has been a writer for the New York Magazine and some other prominent publications. Um, and now he is a documentary producer for films uh, on justice. And so in good fashion, Mr. Brown, <laughs> Why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I've been writing and reporting on criminal justice for close to 25 years. Um, I got my start in an unusual way, I think, which was um, in the early 1990s, I was going to art school, actually, a really tiny art school in Vermont for college uh, that wasn't far from New York City. And uh, my roommate in college was very active in the club scene in New York City in the early 90s, which is like a really exciting time for New York. That's when like hip hop was- The whole urban up. scene. Yeah, yeah, house music, like everything. And he would bring me into, to New he would bring me into New York like almost every weekend. And I was just really taken by kind of the streets of New York and sort of like the drug scene at the time, the like a lot of crime, New York City people, like it's such a safe place now, but don't remember that like in 1991 or 92, it was actually the murder capital of the United States. Right, right. So I was just really just totally taken by New York uh, it, it, at that time. It, you know, it, but I was going to art school and studying uh, literature. They had a really small literature program at the art school. Um, I graduated from there and then immediately moved to New York afterward. I didn't even go home. Um, I'm I'm actually from the Washington D.C. area originally. I didn't. So go that's home. close to the school you went to, right? The art school. Uh, the, no, the art school was actually north of New York City, so so a bit further away. Um, so I, I went to New York right after art school and drifted for a little while. Um, I, I did kind of odd jobs like working in homeless shelters. Um, and then there was an advertisement in the paper for NYU's journalism school. And in the advertisement, there was uh, a writer uh, who had joined the school as a professor who I'd been reading for, for years, mm -hmm. um, uh, who had written for The New Yorker in the 1970s. And I was a big fan of her work. And the ad said, oh, she's teaching at this school now. Um, and she has her own program. And I was like, oh, wow. I didn't really ever want to be a journalist necessarily, but I really love this writer. I went to an open house for the program and then just decided to go and do this program. It was a master's degree program in journalism. So I did the master's program and I've got to say, I was not a good student. Um, I was still kind of in the streets, <laughs> so to speak. What does that uh, mean? Was you, was you still doing the club scene? Which yeah, yes, yes. I was a, extremely like, I can't even imagine it now because I go to sleep at like nine or 10 p.m. But like I was a person who was out literally all night, like all the time, you know, out until the, the sun came up. Um, that wasn't a great journalism <laughs> student. Really well, at all. You know, I, I, I'm from that era. And so I can remember partying like that from the right? sun up to the sundown. Yeah. You know, I wasn't in New York, but right yeah. here at home, I, I can remember the hip hop vibe and what right. it brought to our community. Yeah. Right. Right, so wasn't a great student really at all. Um, I missed a lot of classes. Um, <laughs> I ended up actually though, in a kind of weird way, because I was such a, such a kind of troubled student, I, I was like, you know, I, I need to just do this and then be done with it. So I started working like almost like double or triple time on the master's program. And I actually, I actually graduated from it early Oh, wow. So, so, went, so what, what happened to you? Did something happen? You, uh, you uh, one, of my, one of my professors threatened to fail me in a oh. class. And then I also was just like, you know, I'm not doing this 
well. And it's so it was that guy that saw potential in you just wasting away pretty much. Yeah, and it was also almost my own embarrassment of myself for messing something up, you know? Yeah, I think we all gone through that. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, and it, it inspired me to do it faster and better. And I, so I ended up graduating from NYU with this journalism master's faster than the program actually was. And after NYU, um, I got a bunch of low level jobs in journalism. Uh, the main one being uh, Details Magazine, uh, which at the time in the 90s actually ran like a lot of ambitious journalism. Mm -hmm. It turned into kind of a men's magazine. Uh, right. men's, men's meaning like uh, sort Swimsuit. of. <laughs> ogling women <laughs> men's magazine right 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 of course when I, when I worked there it was like a for really for real um newsroom um and we had like major writers writing for us would, would i be on the right track if i said it was kind of like rolling stone yes exactly right it was perfect yes and uh, and i uh I wasn't writing though. I was just sort of assisting people because I was super young um, and I was still going out a lot. Uh, and, um, and one night I was at a, a warehouse rave. <laughs> I, was, I was in the rave scene pretty heavily in the nineties and I was at a big warehouse rave in New York city downtown and I got robbed. Uh, and the people who robbed me, it was almost like Oh, this is sort of impressive the way that you did this. Like it was sort of like a surgical robbery of all of my stuff, like very quickly. But you didn't know it happened to you until it happened. Until it happened, you know. You know that, that's what they say about New York. You know, my family is from Buffalo, right. New York, and we would often drive up to New York to go to the swap meets. And it would be a whole list of rules before we got out the car because of the way they could rob you. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was like really smooth. And I was like, and as you can see from looking at me now, I'm not, I've always been this way. I don't have jewelry. I always wear just like jeans and a t-shirt. It wasn't like they were robbing like furs or jewelry or anything for me. They just robbed my stuff. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And I asked around, I was like, who? It seemed like this was organized. And I asked around and people told me, oh yeah, there's this, there's a really highly organized gang called the Brooklyn Terror Squad that, uh, that, is, that, is go, that goes around nightclubs, goes around raves, goes around to bars and robs people blind. And wow. they're really good at it. And, and I thought, ha, huh, that's like kind of interesting. And I said to my editor boss at Details, I was like, I mentioned this and he, and he, he said, wow, that is interesting. And he, he brought in a, investigative reporter who had broken the story. And this story has actually been turned into films, including one with Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone <laughs> about, <laughs> about this uh, nightclub figure in New York in the 90s and Michael Eilig, mm -hmm. who uh, killed his, uh, his drug dealer, dismembered him, and then threw the body parts into the Hudson River. Okay. So the my details boss brought in the reporter who broke that story to do this Brooklyn Terror Squad story. And the reporter uh, asked for my help. And this is my first real writing experience. And it was obviously my first real investigative reporting experience. And I was really just like completely taken by it, even though it was not my piece. I was like, this is just fascinating. The, 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 the talking to people, the like pulling of records, like all of it's just so interesting. And the, when the piece was published, it became like a huge piece and the local federal prosecutor actually indicted this gang wow. because they were involved, it turned out, in much more than robbing people. They had, they actually had connections to international drug trafficking. I, I bet when you when you first started on the trail, you had no idea that prosecution was going to come out of it, right? Zero. Exactly. That's a really good question. Zero. I, not only zero idea that prosecution was going to come out of it. Honestly, I was like, it, you know, will this even get published? 
you know, because a lot of things don't get published that get started. Um, so after that, I, I was like, this is, this is kind of what I want to do. Um, and I ended up at New York Magazine shortly after that. And um, wrote, you know, covered crime a, a bit there, but like. Let, let me ask you a question. Sure. Cause it seems like we're gonna talk about, you know, what you do for a while. Yeah. When you first started that, that journey into this gang of thieves, did you find it to be dangerous? Or why did you put yourself in such a situation? And why yeah, did you continue question. to do that? I, I wasn't the reporter on it, I was just assisting. So mm -hmm. I kind of just, I had a, a lot of distance from, from, the, from the story. Um, and I think honestly, at that point, I was glad to have a lot of distance. I was really young. I didn't know very much and I was kind of frightened of everything, you know? Mm -hmm. When you don't know, there's a lot to be afraid of, you know? Um, right, right. So yeah, I mean, I, it, it was scary, but it wasn't my story. So there was a lot of space, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but then when I was at New York Magazine, I was a, a staff writer there first and covering crime. Um, but it, it, was, it was a pretty traditional place and a pretty traditional way of covering crime, which is, you know, covering crime through what the police are doing or prosecutors are doing. Um, and it was not, it was tough. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a great place for me. Um, but by the early 2000s, um, I had, actually this is 2002 is, is the exact year. Um, Jam Master J, the DJ from Run DMC was murdered, right? Right. Just arrested people actually just in the past year, <laughs> like basically 20 years later. But Jam Master J was, was murdered in the fall of 2002. And at the time, prosecutors and police thought that it was a hit um, arranged by a former drug kingpin named Kenneth Supreme McGriff. Mm. had come home from federal prison and the cops and prosecutors thought that he sort of reestablished and reestablished himself on the streets and they believe that he killed Jam Master J. And I started reporting on Supreme for New York Magazine and I did a cover story on Supreme, 50 Cent, 50 Cent and Supreme were actually sort of going back and forth and Irv Gotti, who ran murder. I can recall it, yeah. Yeah, at the time. And they were going back and forth. And the cover story was like this big kind of world of like Supreme, Irv Gotti, and 50 Cent. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a book agent saw that cover story and said, this would be a great book. And to be honest, I hadn't really thought ever of writing books. I, I never really thought of, of, of that story being a book. But I said, you know, let me think about this because I haven't really thought about it. And I ended up spending a few weeks going through newspaper archives uh, from the 1980s, which is when Supreme was a big drug kingpin. He was a crack kingpin in Southeast Queens, mm -hmm. kind of like JFK Airport. And I was like, wow, there's this like incredible world of drug kingpins all from Queens. Uh, there was a guy named Fat Cat, uh, there was Supreme, there was another guy named Tommy Mickens. And I was like, what, nobody's written about this. It's only been like in the tabloids in the eighties, but nobody's ever written anything about it. Wouldn't it, it would be a cool book. So I pitched it as, I pitched it as a book with this literary agent. Actually, pretty much nobody was interested um, for a bunch of reasons, I think like, it was considered, I'm a, a white guy, obviously, but it was considered a black story. And there was just like- Told by a white guy, yeah. Yeah, or not even so much done by a white guy, it was just like, it was sort of considered to be like a marginal thing, you know, that people wouldn't be interested in. Um, and the real sort of thrust of the, of the pitch was that Irv Gotti was being investigated by the feds for his connections to Supreme, but there was no indictment. And, and book editors all said, well, there's no indictment, so there's no case. So this is just a speculative idea anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but 
But then an editor who, who worked in the paperback division of Random House was really into the story, and but only as a paperback. Uh, and he said he wanted to do it. Uh, he was a great editor and I, I did the book with him. And that became a book called Queen's Reign Supreme, which actually was a huge book because it was published right when 50 Cent had his biopic, Get Rich or Die Try in the movie. Mm -hmm. it was also published exactly when Irv Gotti went to trial in federal court. He ended up being indicted and he went to trial. He got acquitted, but there, there was international publicity around the trial as well. Is it is there any mastering of this timing, you know, catching the time, catching the right moment? That's a super just... good question. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I feel like things are luck or maybe if you believe in other things, you know what I mean? You know, I feel like it's a fishing adventure. Like you sit out there on the bank with your, your, with your you know, right. line out there and then all of a sudden something bites and you're like, well, this is the moment. And you have to craft yourself around that moment, you know? It's, it's very true. And I feel like as I've gotten older, the luck element of it has got, has sort of been slowly stripped away. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. I gotta get the dog. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, How and, baby's and he's very oh, <laughs> And that, like, I'm getting better at figuring out what those stories are, you know, without sort of being lucky about them. But that book set me on a course of, you know, wow, this is exciting. I can do these ambitious stories, ambitiously reported stories about the criminal justice system that aren't told through cops and prosecutors, that are told through actual people that are that are not like true crime. I actually really hate that phrase in the <laughs> sense of like, you know, sort of like blood and guts and but with real with no real meaning to anything. Um, and 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 from there on I, I did two more books. Mm -hmm. um, one was about informants, and then the, the third one was about um, an Iraq war veteran from New Orleans who came home from Iraq after, right after, sorry, right before Katrina and uh, had this really sort of horrific time during Katrina and ended up killing his girlfriend and killing himself in this very dramatic fashion. Um, wow. And during that time, and I'll speed it up a little bit, um, I left, because I had this book career, um, I left New York City uh, right around Katrina, actually, right after Katrina, uh, and moved to New Orleans. Um, I've actually been going to New Orleans really regularly with my wife and had wanted to move there since like 2001 or two. And, and, and you, do you feel like something was leading you there or is this just like something like, you know, a dream of yours? You know, it, it, I think especially back then it was like, it, it's a place that had and still has all, many or all the things that I like, meaning like it has music that I like. It, mm. it has like a very very dark side to it. You know, you got a lot of soul for a white boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, a lot of dark stuff that I like. And actually, this is gonna sound weird, but like, um, I was really into and obsessed with, like pretty much from the get-go, cash money records. <laughs> yeah, juvenile. yeah. Have you ever seen Hustle and Flow? The movie? Yeah, I love that movie, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah 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 so it was like it, new orleans had like the sort of like criminal justice stuff that's interesting and music stuff that's interesting um and then like i, I just i i love be i love being there and uh i moved there right after katrina and put out this third book about this iraq war veteran from from new orleans Mm -hmm. And then in 2009, when that came out, this was a, my big break from everything, meaning away from, not big break, meaning stardom. Uh, in 2009, 
I decided to leave reporting and journalism and everything entirely. Um, because I felt like, well, A, I guess the financial crisis had just happened a year before <laughs> and the media was just a kind of a totally destroyed landscape. And then B, I was like, I've done this for a while. I've done these three books. I like the three books, but I don't know. I, I, I it, it, it almost goes back to what we were talking about a second ago or a few minutes ago about me in journalism school. I always felt like an outsider. You know, I didn't really feel like I fit in with journalists and didn't, I don't know, it was weird. And, and so at, at this point, I was just did like, did you find yourself maybe too vested in, in, in the work? Because like, you know, what I do right now, it just seems that I can't have a normal lifestyle without it going into someone talking about what I do because it's a fascinating thing. It, yes. And there, there's times I just don't want to talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yes. that's work. And it just carries on into everything in your life. Is that what you kind yeah, of felt? I, I, yeah, I, I think that's part of it. I mean, the, for for back then, more of it was like, I don't know, like there's just a lot that I don't feel comfortable with in this in the media world. Um, you mean as far as what what was being portrayed in the media, kind of like the Donald Trump area era where you know yeah and, way and, and, yeah and and honestly like mm-hmm. stuff the stuff that I was doing was very adversarial to police and prosecutors and the to imagine the world back then I wouldn't I mean it sounds weird to say like I'm talking about the 1800s but it's but to imagine the world. I think the the thing I say is the world before Black Lives Matter and the world before Michelle Alexander's new So gym. you were seeing the writing on the wall early on in yeah. like this it's a totally, is not it's a what totally I want. world that like you don't question the police, you don't question prosecutors, you don't write about them in any critical way. You don't what are you doing? Like it just, it just doesn't it doesn't happen, you know? Right, they're they're the protection of of, of all of our services. And exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I, someone had mentioned to me, um, oh, so, you know. So it was one of those things, unbeknownst to you, you were rocking the ship. Yeah. Oh, very beknownst to me, though. <laughs> well, I mean, like at, at People, some point, it became more pronounced than like you would have yeah. liked to then. Yeah. I mean, people had pretty strong reactions to my stuff positively and negatively. So I, yeah, I think I was aware of that, but it was, it was more like, I don't know, the, the, this world, this isn't, isn't really me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and New Orleans has a really, really strong um, world of civil rights lawyers and public defenders and people like that. And I was friends with a lot of those people and someone had suggested to me uh, that I might be good at something called uh, mitigation, which is uh, someone who works in a team of attorneys representing someone who is charged in in a death penalty case. And the mitigation specialist uh, prepares um, these really extraordinary histories of the client uh, for the case. Is that like a discovery? so to speak? A little bit. It's more like, like imagine an investigator, but not an investigator of the facts of a crime, but so, an investigator into the life of the person who, who committed the crime. Does that it's, make sense? It's kind of like when they go talk to movie directors and try to pick the life of a serial killer because they've written so many scripts and they're getting these different scenarios. Is that right. what you're saying? Kind of yeah, like yeah, you're I'll, like a theorist. How do you get it? It's getting into not only the head of somebody, but but all of the things that create that person, environmental yeah. things, your parents, where you live, like every every piece of the world that makes you you. You know, like literally every piece. It's a it's a really, really difficult. That's, that's an interesting task to take. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. 
So someone suggested that I would be good at that. And I applied for a job to do this at a law office in New Orleans. Um, and, and in the job interview, I remember really well, they said, what do you, you know, what, what are your feelings about the death penalty? And I remember thinking, I don't really ha actually have any feelings about the death penalty because I don't know anything about it. Um, you know, which is a weird way to answer that question because this law office is so recognized for its work in the death penalty space that people actually come from like Australia to work there. Like it's wow. like an internationally known law office. So somebody so said- So this reminds me of the story about Hurricane Ruben. When oh yeah, yeah, Car Ruben Carter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Ruben Carter. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, that so reminds like, me of the people that were doing the work on his case. Right, right, right. Yeah. So like, when I did my interview with them, I didn't have an opinion about the death penalty. I just thought, well, I was going to get the job, um, but they offered me the job and took the job, and I can't name any of the cases because I'm actually subject to attorney-client privilege the way an attorney would be. But, you don't know how many times I've heard the stipulations, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> not being coy or weird or whatever about right, it. Right, 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 right. Um, just by luck or fate or whatever, like I had a string of cases there that were historic cases for New Orleans, mm -hmm. and it was I'm trying to think of a way to to kind of compare it. Like it's like imagine you know, you, you've written about crime, you, you've thought about it, you, you've done work about it, but then all of a sudden, like, you're in a jail, you know, with people, you're in, you're in prison with people, like, mm. you're inside of these cases. So it, it was like a huge curtain being pulled back, you know? Um, so the so you, you're getting like raw understanding of right, like right. who these people are. Right. So like the first two years, I was just like, you know, holy shit, you know, part of my language. So like, I can't, you know, it's sort of like- Did you drink? Like almost feeling like you're a part of a movie or something, you know? It, it, right, 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 right. It's it, out of body experience almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So during that time, I had a case, a, a quadruple homicide case in Calcasieu Parish, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's weird that we're talking today because as we speak, Joe Biden is in Calcasieu Parish right now. Doing, wow. Doing I, I, I knew it was a reason for the chills running through my body. Yeah, There's yeah. Significant going on today. Doing an infrastructure speech uh, in Calcasieu Parish. And Calcasieu Parish is this area in Louisiana that's right near the Texas-Louisiana border. And I had this quadruple homicide case out there. So it involved me driving from New Orleans to Calcasieu Parish, which is like, if you imagine a state, like imagine one side of the state and the total opposite end, right? Mm -hmm. It was like a really long drive. And uh, to, to get to do the drive, you're, you drive on I-10, this huge highway, which is cuts across a lot of America, actually. Um, and I'm driving on I-10 and I see these billboards like on a high, uh, in, in this part of, 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 of I-10, you would see billboards for like, it's a really, <laughs> it's a really like white, rough, right wing kind of area. So, so you see Dick, Dixie signs and- Yeah, well like hunting stuff, you know, uh. guns. Uh, the next rifle show, RV yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. But then, then there were these billboards featuring the faces of eight women, and and it and it says, you know, reward uh, for information regarding the killing of these eight women. And I think the reward money was seventy five thousand dollars. And I remember I would pass those in I ten, and I was just like. There's something about it that was just really haunting. I think it was the obvious part of it being eight dead women is a lot of people, right? Right. And, but then the, the other part of it was like, 
here they are in the mix with like boudin shops, which is kind of like sausage in Louisiana mm -hmm. and like hunting stores and even like pornography stores. And it was like, what That's is that? It, it's such a weird thing. And it just stuck with me so much. Well, uh, one, black people, black women in particular are not gonna be around some hunting shops. Right. Uh, oh, and, and two, two of the women of the eight were, were black women. Um, oh, so most of them were, were white women. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that so, makes sense then. <laughs> yeah, six of the women were white, two were black. And this case in, in Calgary Parish is quadruple homicide had connections to the drug world that these eight women were a part of um, in, in Western Louisiana. And when I was working on this case, I, I just was like, this is just fascinating because it's like really rural, majority white, but like the drug world is wild crack cocaine just mm -hmm. completely wild and as somebody who reminds came, me of some small parts of Tennessee right right and coming from New York City where the crack era was way in the past right like in the 80s and early 90s it was like whoa I'm in the crack era but a different totally different part of the country and with totally different kinds of people so I was like immediately taken with this world of these murdered eight women, their place in the drug world in rural Louisiana. And in 2011, I had some time off from my job uh, that summer. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go out to Jeff Davis Parish, which is where these women were murdered. Jeff mm -hmm. Davis Parish is right next to Calcasieu Parish. And just, see what I can figure out about this and see if it might be interesting. Um, so I went out to Jeff Davis Parish in the summer of 2011 and I spent about two weeks there. And this is a ties back a little bit into what we were just saying a few minutes ago about like, you know, kind of luck and fate and all of these things. And when do you know something is interesting? within days of, of being in Jeff Davis Parish, not only did I know that this was interesting, I was like, this is the most important story I'll probably ever work on in my life. Mm. Literally within days. And I'm not saying that retroactively, like saying it. Right. You, you know when- I knew it, I knew it. And, yeah. and, 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 and I've never been precious with things like notepads and other little things that I do when I'm reporting, but I actually like anything that I did on that trip, I would put into plastic baggies and seal because I, I felt like this is going to be a really important story in case. Um, and pretty much immediately. So you immediately went into an investigative mode. Yeah, and also like what this is. Did the, you see yourself transforming at that point, like really transforming into something different, or did I you? Know, just, I don't know if it was me transforming. It was more like me recognizing really quickly how important this case was, um, and thinking, what can I do with this because it's that important. Um, with, seriously, within the first week of being there, I had conversations like victim number eight, Nicole Guillory. I interviewed her mother and her mother talked about how Nicole told her multiple times that the police were behind the homicides. Mm -hmm. And Nicole had spilled all this information about the local police department and the sheriff's office and their involvement in the homicides. And in one way, again, especially back then, when we're in this world right now, police shootings and everything being very 
visual, right? Like we can see the things that people right. have been talking about or experiencing for decades, if not hundreds that, of that years. That you couldn't see in the 90s. Right, you know, even this was 2011, it just wasn't a thing, you know? So the idea that like police would be murdering people or police would have a hand in this was just, it, it was like fiction, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but I was compelled because the people who were talking to me had real things to say, you know? Um, and so I was still working in the death penalty world, but I thought I have to do something with this. And I pitched an editor at GQ magazine and GQ like a Rolling Stone or, 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 or some, uh, some other big magazines, they will do really serious journalism. Mm -hmm. Um, and I pitched an editor there, uh, who was like instantly taken with the story and said, you know, go and go and go and do this. Um, and I think largely because of the way that I've been conditioned with my death penalty work, which is so labor intensive in terms of investigation. I, I just spent months and months and months, um, doing Public Records Act requests, doing really heavy investigation into the case um, before I did anything in terms of writing or any, any, anything else. And I ended up getting a lot of stuff and I don't think started really writing until like the, the end of the first year of working on it. Did you become overwhelmed at any point with all the information that was coming? No, I, it, it sounds weird to say, but no, because in my death penalty job, I, I could have a case that has a hundred thousand pages of discovery. Mm -hmm. So if I have five thousand pages or a thousand pages or two thousand pages, which which is the kind so of you've been well uh, seasoned for this. Yeah, yeah, nothing. So it was easy. I mean, not easy in terms of writing it or easy in terms of but making but, it a narrative but it and keeping it. Yeah, yeah. That it was so the, the death penalty work had really conditioned me for that and. I, I, in 2012 and 2013, I was writing this piece for GQ. It was taking a long time. <laughs> um, and then in the fall of 2013, the piece had yet to be published and I was getting impatient mm -hmm. uh, with the process. And I, this, is, this is a moment where it's truly out of your hands. There's no predicting any of this. And right. Then, uh, right as I was getting frustrated, um, HBO dropped the teasers for True Detective, the first season with Matthew McConaughey and right. Woody Harrelson. And that show is set in basically the exact same place that this Jeff Davis aid case was set. And just by total coincidence, and I went to my editors and higher ups at GQ and said, this show is coming in early 2014 with Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. It's set literally in the same place. And it's basically about the same thing. Law enforcement corruption, sex work, drugs, like this whole world of West Louisiana. I said, oh my God. And this yeah. is a real story. This is, this is crazy. Like yeah. this is the real version of it. Um, that didn't really move them, but um, unfortunately, but fortunately, uh, at the same time, my editor got a, a job offer to go to a, a, an online site called Medium, which is now something very different. But back then it was basically like an online magazine. And he took the piece with him. And my piece about the Jeff Davis State was published in January, 2014, which is, the exact time that True Detective premiered on HBO was, was basically the biggest show in the world at that time. Right, right. So people were obsessively reading my piece and a lot of people were speculating that True Detective was based on this case. It was not. Um, so the piece really took on this huge life that I've you know, never really experience in my whole career in terms of attention, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I was 
thinking, you know, I have so much work on this case that's not in the piece. And there's, there, there's also more investigation that I want to do on this. I should think about doing a book about it. And I pitched a book about the Jeff Davis aid case to a number of publishers, two or three bit on it. Um, there was an editor at Scribner, which is a part of Simon and Schuster, who was really smart and really excited about it. I decided to go with him. And then in 2016, uh, the book was published called Murder in the Bayou. And then right afterward, uh, a, a production company approached me about turning it into a documentary series. Um, it we, sounds like God wanted you to have the book beforehand, like a pre, preset yeah, to, to yeah. a documentary. Like, yeah, that's like a double blessing to me, you know, yeah. the virtue sometimes. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was almost a continuum. The way that I, it, I mean, it was a continuum. When, when I wrote the article, I thought there needed to be more work done. So let's do a book. When I wrote the book, believe it or not, I felt like there was a lot of work that still needed to be done on the case. Mm -hmm. So I said, that was the real attraction to me about a documentary series. I was like, I really want to do more work on this case. And so. So just, just to ask you a question, yeah. what did the documentary do for justice? Like what is so important about documentation and for the world to see that? So I think the documentary series does a lot for this story. I think, well, the first thing it does is as a writer, like you can, I don't know, I feel like writing is limited in, in many ways, um, particularly when it comes to things like family members of the victims in this case. Is it more like the perception can be drawn a number of ways versus if you see it visually, you can get that right, yes. Someone can read something, right, and come away with very different things. I think that's somewhat true of, of film and TV, but maybe less so. So the, the documentary series really centers the families in a huge, huge way. It's very personal. It's very intimate. I remember the, the initial reactions to the series were like, you know, how did you get people to sit with you like that? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very, very intimate, personal kind of portrait of all of these families um, who, without getting into a long story, who had been really, really marginalized and treated like crap and just had, had, a, had a not good, you know, kind of representation of themselves out there, you know? Mm -hmm. So it did that. The second thing was, that I think advanced a lot of the stuff in the book about why the cases were so poorly handled about the involvement in law enforcement in the cases. Um, so it moved the ball in terms of, you know, the understanding of these cases. Um, and then, you know, ultimately though, and this goes all the way back to the article, in 2014, when the article was published, I was contacted by the FBI pretty quick because there's major law enforcement misconduct. Well, you know, I know when we were working on the chill bill and um, Keith Beauchamp was working on the documentary of Emmett Till, mm -hmm. you know, the FBI contacted him as well. And so, right. you know, I knew the answer to the question. I just wanted yeah. so, to hear it out loud, you know. So you get these contacts from DOJ and it don't really go anywhere a lot of times, you know? Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, New Orleans was coping with the aftermath of an epidemic of police killings that happened after Katrina. Mm -hmm. And the DOJ came down in a huge way on those cases and indicted cops and all kinds of other things. But I didn't really 
see those cases as justice in a way. They were like justice for individual cases or people, but not a collective concert. Not, not a big shift in how things are. And, and then that combined with like DOJ contacts with me not really going anywhere. I was kind of skeptical of the idea that, you know, this documentary series comes out and then all of a sudden everything changes. This, you know, it's just not the way it works. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's difficult, you know. Um, do, do you think even in its difficulty though, that at least there is the truth out there? Um, you know, it, it just reminds me of the fabric of this country and even what we're listening to right now when we're talking about Republicans wanting to put legislation to re-evoke the brief Israel. Mm -hmm. I think that's ridiculous, uh, but here we are. You know, here we are mm -hmm. with a bunch of Karens and Kens who want black people to stay in their place, um, re reinventing Jim Crow. I mean, there are a number of things that is going on to me that just spells out that, you know, they want things to always be the same. So even though we may display it, it's just at the heart of what this country is about, you know, the fabric of what it was built on that, that keeps the cover up going. Am, am I kind of on the right page or what do you, you think? You are, yeah. And, I, and I've got to say, like, especially given my experience working in the criminal justice system, working directly inside of it, the, I didn't mention this before, but the latter half of it, I worked in the death penalty world for about, sorry, calculating in my head, about seven years, eight years. Mm -hmm. The latter half of it, just by coincidence, was almost entirely spent in prison because I was working on prison murder cases. Mm -hmm. which are, in federal prison, that's basically an automatic federal capital case, but even in state prison, it's, it's usually a capital case as well. So I spent years at Angola in Louisiana. I spent years in touring the country's federal prisons. <laughs> I've been to almost every federal prison in America. And I had really, really become not only skeptical, but like sort like the, these institutions and systems cannot produce justice. No. Prisons, jails, policing, et cetera. Um, they weren't designed for that. They that, weren't designed this, for that. That's the history that people keep missing. They keep wanting to say, well, yes. things evolve. No, they haven't. Yes. Even to, I, you know, I try to explain to people like in the 90s, New York had a case against them where they used to have protect and serve on a car. And they had to remove that because they had a suit against them um, because mm -hmm. they weren't into protecting and serve. I think their mission say, statement says they're there to protect state and property. Correct. And, yes. and so people have this misunderstanding because there's this office of community policing that wants to join hands with you, but at the end of the day, that's not what they were designed for. And I don't know how that missed people. And I think it's because the history has been so whitewashed. No, that's exactly right. And then, yeah, you know, it's like during the Obama era, there was a lot of police reform, you know, sort of happening. And I think people maybe got caught up in that, that, oh, wow, isn't it exciting? We can do consent decrees. We can do, we can indict cops. We can do all these things. And Eric Holder, you know, who is a, is a really smart guy and, you know, was the attorney general at the time, like, um, you know, like we can reform these institutions. And I think, unfortunately, particularly since George Floyd, people have realized, <laughs> Oh, I, it's not not going to work like that, you know. Right. That, I mean, I, the the Minneapolis Police Department that you know killed George Floyd has gone through a, a ton of you know sort of reform periods um, and a lot of reform attention. 
Um, so well, if you're if you're inf infiltrated by the most corrupt, you know, organization that just wants to reign supreme, then I don't know what else other people would expect and would act as if it wasn't there. You know, it's been there since its inception, even within the sheriff's department, you know. So it, it's one of those things that like too, when we look at the United States Constitution, it's been long overdue for a new constitution. Why are we still holding on to these old, insaneous, evil ways of living and being? Like the supremacy thing is really got to die. And it's been a long time for a new constitution. Why are you trying to reinvent three-fifths brew when everybody is human? You know what I mean? It, it, it just makes absolute absurd sense to me. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know that's it's true. Yeah, I mean, there are all these you know, systems and documents and things that, that, pe that we adhere to and maybe they have to be completely scratched or rethought up, I don't know. Um, but yeah, with, pr with prisons and policing and prosecutors, especially, <laughs> like, you know, um, I I'm sort of long, long off of them as as um, as a source of justice or as a source of hope for anything. So, um, as, as, you know, because, you know, we can get long winded. I told you I, I get very long winded. I think information is great. But as, as, as a final thought, what what do you think should like be happening? Because, you know, I feel the same way you do. I think that this system in, invents the excuses like it's yeah. it's a part of the whole matrix it's a part of the the whole ideal of how it runs is that even the excuses help to make it progress that's my opinion i just think it, it all needs to shut down but in your opinion and what your words are what do you think could help the criminal justice system to actually fair and justice the scales be balanced um, get rid of the entire thing <laughs> I, um you know, I mean, that sounds kind of facetious, but it, I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of true. Like, I, I think, you, I think the place that you want to start is investments, right? Like, what do we invest in? Mm -hmm. If we invest in police, if we invest in prisons, if we invest in prosecutors, we need to really rethink those investments and take that money and take those resources and put it in much better places. You know, the criminal justice system at its best, all it does is clean up a mess that's already been made. And there is no unmaking the bigger messes, right? Like someone being murdered, you know? There's no bringing that person back to life. There's no erasing that trauma. There's no filling the holes that people have when they have a loved one murdered. So putting someone in a cage for 40 years or life for a murder, I don't see that as a real response to that harm. So I think you wanna like take all of the investments that you put into these institutions that don't really address harm in any way and put them into places that can prevent the harm from happening in the first place. That's what I think, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think, you know, collectively, ideals like that and, and ideals from other people, um, I think can make a difference. Um, what I do know is that, in my opinion, we're fighting against principalities, good versus evil. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, a, it's a, a fight of, of conscious minds and being, being um, I don't like to use the word woke, but being knowledgeable. Right. Of, what's really going on, keeping your eyes open. And then at the end of the day, really be willing to stand up and do something about it. You know right. what I mean? Let's just leave the idea that you don't see color and all these other uh, fictitious and fashionist things that come up and really go to work about what's important That's every person deserves to live a fair life. Every person deserves equity. Every person deserves equality. Every person deserves to choose. You know, and, and that's what freedom's supposed to look like. So how do we get to that point without all of these conversations about the smoke and mirrors of racism? Right. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Uh, and, and taking exactly what you said to the criminal justice system, you know, mm -hmm. 
working for people who are charged in capital cases, you really see like all of the things that are missing um, in terms of like, if, if everybody had clean air, decent schools, healthcare, living wages, mm -hmm. like all the things that are really truly basic that America is so bad at, you Sustainability. would, yeah. yeah, you would not see these things happening. I'm convinced of it, um, like at all, you know, and that's, and, and like the great tragedy of these cases is that like, I would say pretty much a hundred percent of the time, I really liked all of my clients very much, even clients who did the worst possible things that, you know, you can imagine. And I always imagined like how their lives would have turned out differently had they had all of these basic things that they just never had, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I just thank you greatly for- oh, thank you sitting on my platform. It has been a wonderful conversation. I hope so. Yeah. Um, I want you to continue to enjoy your day on purpose. Everybody, <laughs> you, you do the same. I leave you in love, peace, and hair grease. This program is brought to you by